Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Like really ready? All right, everybody, let's give it up for Jake Nichols. I told you it could be a little disarming when we do that. So tell us about your childhood. Tell us about where you grew up. Uh, the kinds of things you were doing, and maybe was there a, a moment when you realized, like, hmm, I, I want to build stuff, I want to design stuff, I want to create stuff? Yeah, uh, my childhood was kind of um, all over the place. My dad was in the Army growing up, so um, <clears throat> up until about fourth grade, uh, we weren't the most well-off, I guess. Uh, we, we moved around a lot. We lived on army bases. Um, I was born, when I was born, we were living in a uh, used mobile home that my dad bought for $7,000 in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and then we moved to Colorado and then moved to um, Missouri and then down to Texas for a little while and then um, ended up in um, Crown Point, Indiana, like about 45 minutes from here. Uh, and that was fourth grade, and that's when my dad had worked his way through the Army to pay for college and um, became a pathologist. So he got a job at uh, the hospital wow. down there. So, cool. Yeah, it was a big change for our family then, and um, that's when we kind of settled down. And we, So I grew up mostly in Crown Point until college. Awesome. So tell us what you were doing as a kid. And I think you mentioned that you kind of got into programming. Yeah, uh, my dad got me, um, well, got the family uh, Prodigy back in like 1993, 94. Everybody know Prodigy? They're like, no. <laughs> All right. Kind Show of like your an age. AOL competitor yeah. when you used to get those CDs in the mail or That's floppy right. disks in the mail. Floppy <laughs> disk. Who still has a floppy disk? Uh. So we, I would dial up into Prodigy and um, start started learning about the internet and um, I started learning how to uh, use Photoshop and create websites when I was 13 or 14 years old then. And I would learn just by clicking view source in the web browser and I could see, you know, the code behind a website and just kind of reverse engineered it and figured out how to build websites when I was in high school. So were you then self-taught as a programmer or? Yeah, as a programmer I've been self-taught. Um, and, and then I used to even, like I, I would walk around my town and go door to door and ask businesses if I could build them websites as wow. like a 15 year old kid. And how much were you charging for those websites? Well, I was doing them really for free for a while and then there was a the internet service provider in our town that you would buy dial up internet from ended up hiring me and I so I built a bunch of websites for small businesses like plumbers and stuff in Crown Point, Indiana. Some of those are actually still live today. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of funny. Yeah. That's awesome. But then I got burnt out on it, and um, <laughs> I stopped. At the ripe old age of? Like 16 or 16, so. right. Because <laughs> I was ex really excited about it. In fact, before I got the job, too, I was building websites for, you know, my favorite bands or um, my hobbies, like snowboarding and stuff. I would build little websites to show pictures from my snowboarding trips. Um, and I had bunion surgery when I was 15 years old, which bunion is not surgery? really a common yeah. time for that to happen to people. And um, I think it, it mostly happens to women too. So I don't know. But um, so I had this bunion surgery and I uh, documented it and I built a website about bunion surgery and I became the number one search result for bunion surgery. Now, I got to say, that is something to be proud of. Seriously. Was this pre-YouTube or what? Yeah, this was like in 1995. Oh my God, you would have made a hundred million dollars with YouTube Free Google. off that. Yeah. So the search engine was web crawler. But, oh, yeah, right. but so it, and then I had a lot of um, elderly women reaching out asking for advice on whether or not they should uh, get bunion surgery, <laughs> and I became this like go-to source for. Um, I was a bunion surgery expert. Oh my God. And that's when I learned about community on the internet. Oh, that's very cool. So this. That was a very nice segue from bunions <laughs> to communities. <laughs> no, it's very cool. Now, you, you did go 
Did you go to college for design initially, right? Yeah, so I, while I was doing this, you know, programming and stuff, I started to get, I, I got more into the art side of things, and I started when I was more like 17, 18, I started writing a lot of graffiti around my town. <laughs> um, were, they, were they okay with that? But no, they weren't too happy with it. But um, I got more into to art, and so, um, I don't know, I've had a, my background is like, a lot on the art side of stuff, and then also on technical, more like math. On my SATs, I did terribly in um, literacy, and I did really well in math. Like I missed one on the math portion, but then I missed, I don't know, a wow. ton on the, on the other side. I don't know what the word is for that. Yeah, left brain, right brain. Yeah. <laughs> Genius? I don't know. Um, so, you, but you did go to art school, right? And yeah, I went to um, the Illinois Institute of Art, which is the campus I went to was a building in the parking lot of the Schomburg, the mall in Schomburg. Very um, glamorous. Yep. Very, very nice. And um, I learned, my degree was multimedia web design, and I started learning about um, director, that macromedia director, and flash, and stuff like that. And, during that time, I got a job as a web developer again, downtown. So I then switched to the downtown campus here. They have a campus in the Merchandise Mart, too. Oh, wow. Very cool. Did not know that. Um, so tell us how, and I, I don't know if folks know this or not. Oh, by the way, what year are we talking about? This is like late 90s-ish or so? Yeah, like 98, I think. Okay. Is when they went. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if folks know this or not, but there actually was a predecessor to Threadless. So maybe tell, and this is a great, maybe tell us how Dreamless, right? Yeah. How that came about and, and so on. So since I had been making these personal websites all the way back into high school, um, I, there was like a bunch of little community, little design communities that were starting to sprout up online, like um, Chank, Chank Army and like the all these little things. And I, I remember learning JavaScript from this guy Doc Ozone who had these little these little communities. And I found this site called Dreamless.org, and it was just this really abstract kind of message on the on the front page. And when you but if you clicked View Source on Dreamless.org, it gave you the instructions on how to find it. So I figured it out. And then there were like there were 300 people in there, and it was the secret forum online. Um, mostly for designers and mo more like digital, like web designers, people who are experimenting with code to create art and, and stuff. And so I joined this forum, and um, it, it's been, it was an international forum, so artists all around the world were using this thing. Um, and so Threadless started because a lot of the people on this forum um, spoke at this event called Flash Forward back in the day, and it was like a $600 ticketed event. Hmm. But if you were on the forum, the people who would speak at the forum said, we'll stay an extra day, and we'll do the presentation for free the next day if you're on the forum. So there was like this piggyback event called New Media Underground Festival, and they held a uh, t-shirt design challenge for the official t-shirt for the event. And I submitted a design to it, and uh, my design got selected for, for the event. Um, and I started Threadless literally like an hour after that by just, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah. I just started a thread on Dreamless saying that was a really fun experience to have just, you know, submitted a design and have it be the official t-shirt for this event. We should just, how about if you guys have other ideas for cool t-shirt designs, post them in this thread and I'll print the best ones. And so right away over the first like month of this thread existing, there were about 300 designs submitted. And wow. I chose five of them to print. I think one of them is up in here somewhere. It's still like there's one design from that batch of five that we can print, print today and it'll still wow. sell. Um, it's two cars crashing into each other and it says yeah. Control Z, like undo. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so then, you know, the first five shirts came from that thread and then um, I started the threadless.com website to. Uh, uh, where people could submit designs on that going forward. Um, and then it's really worked the same, pretty much the same, I mean, since then. Like, people come to the site, post designs, they get scored, and then we print the best ones. 
So um, one thing, and we talked about this a little bit, is at the time, um, you probably didn't realize this, but on when you were using Dreamless and those threads and Threadless, um, that was really sort of your MVP. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it was like kind of proved proved it by you know printing that first batch of those five shirts and sold those quickly, and I knew I was kind of onto something. Onto something. Yeah, I mean that's your that's your validation right there. So in the beginning, I mean you're, you we always talk about. Uh, Problem solving, you know, startups solve problems. Um, tell us about the problem that you think you were solving. Well, I think, I don't know, I think there's a lot of different things going on. Um, one of the things for me personally was uh, I, di I didn't, I mean, I was a sophomore in college when I started this, so I was, you know, still pretty, quite young. And, um, Coming out of high school, one of the things I really disliked was um, how a lot of apparel that people would wear was basically like corporate logos. You know, it'd be Tommy Hilfiger or Gap or Aeropostel or whatever it is. Like, and I, it's just I thought so. What my wardrobe consisted of was mostly like concert T-shirts. You know, because at least then I felt like I was supporting a an artist, a musician, like it was, and it spoke more to who I am as a individual because I don't really identify, I guess, with uh, with like a mega brand so much. Yeah. And you'll look at all of our shirts today; they don't say threadless anywhere on the outside, and That's right. you know yeah. they're they're really about the art and the individual who creates those. Um, and I think threadless was, I mean, I didn't know of anywhere else that existed where you could just buy art on a T-shirt at the time. Yeah. I didn't, but I didn't think other people would want that either. Like it kind of surprised me to see that a lot of people um, seem to share that that desire. So yeah. I think that's one need I was. So I mean, it's interesting because um, you're really sort of solving two problems at at that time: one for the artist or designer, and one for the consumer. Yeah, because on the flip side, also, like, I mean, somebody does design all this apparel that we can buy at the malls, but you never know who it is. And no right. credit really goes back to that person, really. So this is a way to show, you know, that these are real people creating these things, and here's their talents and stuff. Yeah. Does everybody, I mean, is everybody familiar with Threadless and kind of the model and how it works and so on? If anybody new, maybe just walk us through it. Um, it's fairly simplistic. Um, yeah, it's an open call for design submissions on our website. So. You just kind of, if you're an artist who wants to submit something, you download our templates, put your design on them, and then upload them for scoring. So then we post it up and show our community. We have about three and a half million members who can vote on designs, and we've had about 300,000 people submit art to us. Whoa, wow. So then those people like put their opinions into the mix about what we should print. Um, and then the best ones we we print and market to our customers. What's the what's the tipping point? Like what what determines what gets printed? I mean I know well, the voting, but it, like what? The way we do it is we we print six new designs every week, and the way we select those six is we just look at what the top scoring designs are each week and make decisions from there. So it's not a hundred percent democratic, where just the top six designs are guaranteed to be printed um, because. Sometimes there will be themes that come in and out where it doesn't make sense for us to print, you know, six of the same theme shirt, even if that's the what's popular right now. Um, so there's a little bit of curation going on, and also top scoring doesn't necessarily mean top selling, right? Because a lot of times people want to wear something a little more, like, almost controversial, where they're making a statement from the. Yeah, shirt. I was going to ask you that. So is there um, some sort of filtering process? I mean, obviously. With designs, it could be offensive, or, or is yeah. it a self-filtering? We do process? filter them right now, where um, we look at every single design that gets submitted and approve or decline it. But we're thinking about um, phasing that out and having more of a, uh, like, putting a verification step in place where we know this is a like verifying their PayPal account because. We're going to have to be able to pay them if they win, so that's a good little identity where I, we can make sure this is a real person. Um, and then putting a flagging system in place where if it's inappropriate, we'll take it down. 
but right now we approve and decline it. We look at everything and approve or decline it. Got it. So let's go. Let's go back a bit. So um, you discovered that there's a demand for this. Created Threadless. You're still in college at the time. Yeah, and um, yeah, I still had a couple more years left. I was still. I was. I was also working a full-time job as a web developer. So um, I switched to part-time school, um, and uh, was basically moonlighting as much as I could outside of work and, and uh, college to, to uh, put time into Threadless. So what I, I get this question a lot, um, and we were sort of talking about this earlier. So at what point, and you, you quit school. Yeah, I dropped out um, with about 10 courses left. So tell us about that experience. I mean, is that, was it kind of a gut-wrenching kind of thing, or? Yeah, it was, I mean, so I, the, the issue was I had hired my first employee, and I couldn't be at the office because I was going to school, and I had to make this decision about, you know, should I put everything into the business or should I continue on with school? And I went to the dean and I spoke with him, and he actually gave me um, credit for seven of those 10 courses. So I only had to complete three more. Wow, that's more. cool. But uh, I don't know. I don't like to tell this story very much. But like, <laughs> there's a, I actually wrote a chapter for a book on um, Macromedia Flash on action scripting. And um, one of those three classes that he would not test me out of, that book was the, was the book that I had to buy to take the class. So you wrote part of the book. <laughs> That's unbelievable. So I was just like, I'm out of this. Right. I was angry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Wow. So from there, now you're walking away from school. And, and so were you doing this now at like out of an apartment or? Oh, yeah. and one thing too I didn't ask you about, um, co-founder. Right. Yeah. So I started it with um, this guy who was going to, he was also on Dreamless, and he was going to Purdue, where my girlfriend at the time was, was going. And so we started talking about um, you know, code and, and learning about JavaScript together and stuff. And um, so he really helped out in the early days. So he's been out of the business since about 2007 now. Got it. But, yeah. Very cool. And then so at what point did you decide, all right, we've got to get space, and we've got to get serious, and? Um, well, there were, there were like these two-year increments that um, all led up to this. So the first two years, Threadless was a complete hobby, side project. I was going to school, going to work. Um, and then I dropped out of school, and I quit my job around the same time. But I didn't um, leave to pursue Threadless 100% of the time. Um, we, Threadless is owned by a parent company called Skinny Corp. And Skinny Corp was started to be kind of like a web design consultancy firm. So we were doing websites for clients, um, and we used Threadless as proof that we knew how to build an e-commerce website. Hmm. So we were building websites for like McDonald's and Kohler and Office Max, and we supplemented a lot of work from the big agencies downtown here. They would shoot stuff our way a lot of the time. Um, so we did that for about two years um, while running Threadless on the side. Um, and that's when we got our first office space, too, was around that time. Um, and then the, the next two years, we, so Threadless was growing organically on its own without a lot of effort um, to the point where we were bringing in more revenue from Threadless than we were through all these clients. And so we fired all of our clients. <laughs> and uh, we started pursuing, but instead of pursuing Threadless full-time, what we thought would be the best idea is to just pursue our own projects full time. So we started up like eight other businesses. Um, we started up this business called Naked and Angry that was kind of like Threadless, but it was for patterns. So, and we actually still have some product for sale on our site today um, from that. But we started a business called I Park Like an Idiot. <laughs> I Park Like an Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, we sold bumper stickers in 20 packs, so the idea was put the bumper sticker on other people's cars. <laughs> oh, how did that one go over? We got on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I bet you did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started uh, 15 Megs of Fame, which was um, crowdsourcing of music, so the idea was 
you know, independent musicians, post your music, it'll get scored and listened to, and the best ones will get record deals for you. But we weren't able to pull off getting people record deals. <laughs> <laughs> we started uh, extratasty.com, which was um, a drink recipe website where you basically put in all the um, alcohol and mixers and anything that you have in your kitchen, and it'll tell you what drinks you can make kind of thing. Um, started needs, needshelp.org where it's like if you're if you need to raise money for something um, you can register like you know Tom needs help.org and Tom it'll, does need help <laughs> and you can use that to to raise funds but. did any of those uh, you know it's pretty interesting that I always preach to startups about focus and you've got eight other sort of things going on. Did any of those evolve into like a yeah. real business? Or? What we learned is it's really hard to start up a fresh brand from zero over and over again. Yeah. So we do still you know, do this type of thing, but we do it underneath the threadless umbrella so that we can leverage what we've built here uh, for, the, for the idea. So um, we actually just like a week ago launched a new um, app on the app store called type tees by threadless and we're leveraging threadless you know for all this but the idea is it's just a little app where you can type in a slogan and just get that slogan printed on a t-shirt you, you choose from like a dozen different templates that'll make your slogan look really good but you're just able to buy like a custom t-shirt really quickly with your slogan on it that's very cool um so uh what year are we talking about now when you've got Sort of these eight additional startups and and threadless and so on and so that would be like around 2006 is when we said, all right, let's roll all these startups up and let's roll the ones up that make sense back into threadless and then shut down as many of the other ones that make sense um, and then it was really full time threadless. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to me that over the course of that period, threadless was almost not. You know, was not the focus, but then continuously emerged, like it should be the focus. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is that Threadless was just organically growing in the background without us really doing anything. <laughs> I mean, because um, just the business model of how artists submit designs, they get scored, and the best ones we print is conducive to um, growth. Just because these artists are putting six hours of work into each of their design designs and then um, obviously they're incentivized to go spread the word about what they've done um, and get their design printed so in the background we had this snowballing business that was slowly building I mean it wasn't like an overnight yeah. thing but yeah it was growing in the background that's awesome so at, at what point did you guys move here this building we've um, been here about three years got it where were you guys located before we were up and down Ravenswood for a long time. Uh, there was this uh, landlord that owned like every building up and down Ravenswood. So every year when we grew out of our space, we'd be able to just grab a lease on another space because it's the same landlord and he didn't care that we were breaking our previous lease if we're going to grow into a bigger one. Was that so like 2007-ish or so? Uh, is, did you start building out a, a marketing team and so on? Because you, you've mentioned a few times that you really didn't do anything. It wasn't until about 2009 that we really started focusing on marketing more. Um, but we did do a lot of things that you could consider marketing, but we, w we didn't call it marketing and we didn't have a marketing department per se, you know? Like, um, you know, giving people tools. When somebody submits a design, giving them some tools on how they can spread the word about that design, and um, including stickers in our packages and you know like more organic kind of so empowering the designer in a way yeah and a lot of a lot of pr too i think during that time so i think uh, what uh, late 2000s uh you decided to walk away yeah well i um moved to colorado in 2008 and um but I was still involved in the business, so I uh, set up a satellite office out there. I hired a CEO here um, and moved out there for a period of about three years. And how did that work? 
it was I mean, it was a nice break. I was feeling a little bit um, overwhelmed by the management side of the business because I think I'm like, I mean, my background is in art and development, and I'm, I identify more with the maker side of the business, you know, building features and um, the growth that the business was seeing in 2006, 2007. Um, I mean, we were tripling, quadrupling in size during those years, and it was a pretty stressful time. So <laughs> I kind of wanted to get back into um, the feature building and building of the platform of the business and thought it'd be fun to, and well, and also I had a, uh, my daughter was born in 2007, and I wasn't, like I didn't grow up in big cities, and I was nervous about raising my child in a big city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wanted to move out and I moved to Boulder, Colorado, which was a nice place to, to you know, raise my kids for the first few years. Cool, very cool. And, that, and then you decided to come back. Yeah. yeah. So our son was born out, out in Colorado, and he was born with some, um, some health problems that made it hard to be away from uh, family, because most of our family's here. Um, and it was also just hard being away from the business. I mean, um, everything's happening here, and... Uh, it was a little bit difficult to s try to start up a team remotely um, when there's a team here, and it, it created a, a little bit of some, you know, confusion there. So, ended up moving back, and you know, I actually like being away from the Midwest. Made me really uh, appreciate it even more. Um, and we moved back into Evanston now, which is nice for I think raising the family up there is a little easier than being downtown. Um, but. Yeah, it was a great decision. I'm really happy to be back. Were there any, when you came back and you've got sort of um, almost two different management teams or what have you, what were some of the challenges you faced when you did come back? Um, well, coming back was, uh, I mean, I was extremely involved in the business remotely and I'd come back every month. So I was working really closely with the whole management team here. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of like miss. I guess, misalignment with what was happening here. Um, but I did definitely want to sink my teeth back in more being here because uh, I felt like the online platform needed a lot of love at that point um, because what I was trying to do by moving away didn't exactly work the best. <laughs> you know, we, didn't, we weren't, weren't able to really build that team that we needed to there. Um, so I did feel like there was a lot of catch up that we needed to do on the on the actual website side, but on the flip side, the um, some of the new business models that we were exploring were really interesting. Like we um, did a few licensing deals with uh, huge IP companies like you know D Disney and Marvel and Nickelodeon, so that um, our community could remix and reimagine the content of those. Ooh, cool. So the, there were all these little like new business models started up while I, while I was away um, that were really exciting to dive into. That's very cool. So what, let, let's prognosticate a little bit, you know, crystal ball, like what, what is ahead for Threadless? Um, I think um, I, I really want to make the um, online platform like the number one place well i would argue that it already is like the number one place to just as an artist share and monetize your work um but in order to do that that we really have to stay on our toes and keep innovating and stuff i mean like i said our uh, process hasn't changed a whole lot since 2000 when we started this where people submit designs they get voted on we print the best ones and um, I think there's a lot more interesting things to be done on top of that that uh, um, could help grow this company a lot, um, a lot larger. Awesome, very cool. Um, who's, your, who's your hero and why? <laughs> um, I really, I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin <laughs> because, uh, and he was one of, one of the clients that we fired actually. Really? Because, <laughs> uh, we got hired to design Squid Who, which is his, his um, startup. And uh, we got a little bit through that project and then decided, yeah, made this decision that we're gonna focus on our own projects. But he is just, I, I mean, I think he's amazing. Like the way that he thinks about um, marketing as well, where it's really about creating just a really remarkable experience for people. And 
you know, uh, I like to just, I, I just like his ideas a lot. Yeah, does everybody know who Seth Godin is for the most part? If you don't, you should. Definitely check him out. Um, well, cool. Why don't we just kind of open it up for questions um, in the crowd? I know there's going to be tons. So let's, 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 questions. Come on, people. Come on, come on. There we go. Um, so my first time I ever printed anything was in when I, when I was like 15 in my skate team. We wanted to get like skateboard team shirts, you know. So I was familiar with this idea of contract screen printing where pretty much any small town has like a screen printer that you could uh, reach out, like you can look up in the yellow pages really and find. Um, but my co-founder had a, like his mom's friend or something had a, a screen printing <laughs> shop. So we used her for about the first year. Um, and then we've been working with uh, all kinds of different printers over the years. but. We work with four printers here in Chicago right now. Um, Culture Studio, Shirts Our Business, Sharp Print, and Target Graphics. Um, and all four of them are, are just really great. Yeah. <laughs> so in uh, 2012, we decided to do a uh, tour where um, we outfitted this trailer to be kind of like a mobile art gallery. And we uh, went all across the country holding events uh, in various cities and stuff. So. And then most recently, we took it to Vegas for the Magic Trade Show. And so our booth was um, built around the trailer. Um, and we, so we had like the whole line that we were shopping and Magic um, inside the trailer. And you could kind of like build out the stuff that you wanted to buy inside. Um, we don't have any retail stores, but this we used to have a couple. Um, but now our... Uh, the headquarters here are open to the public to come uh, to come buy from. Tell us a little bit about that experience and how how it came about, and you know why you sort of uh, sort of ruled that out. So we started our retail store, first retail store in 2007, um, and I, it opened on the day that my daughter was born, <laughs> which was pretty crazy timing, but. Uh, the, so the, the purpose was we, in about 2005, starting around 2005, we started getting a lot of interest from retailers wanting to carry our product. Um, and we weren't, we didn't feel very strongly that like a threadless shirt on the shelf would do justice to the artist and their story. So we wanted to experiment with ways to tell the threadless story. Because when you're on the website, you can easily see who made the thing, and you can click their name, and you can see what other work they've made, and you can like really quickly learn about what's happening there. But when you're a shirt on a shelf, and we, we had been doing a lot of events at concerts and stuff where we had the same issue, where when you have a 10 by 10 booth and you just have a rack of shirts up, you don't really get the, the story. So we, we thought it'd be fun to start up a retail store that um, did that. And so we had things like, in the window, you could um, take a picture of yourself and your face would be on the model in the window. Um, you could, every shirt, every design in the store had like a monitor with comments being fed in real time about the what people think about the design, um, who made it and all this stuff. And um, But it was, so that was seven years ago and um, it wow. got a little outdated and also it felt so people would actually like come to Chicago from around the world to see our retail store. And it was you know, a 600 square foot facility that showed the, the most recent 12 designs on Threadless. And meanwhile, we have this here. And we thought if somebody's gonna come like fly to Chicago to see Threadless, they should come here because this is really where um, the excitement is, I think. Um, but the retail store was great. Like it was uh, profitable, I mean, it was a small amount of revenue, but it was profitable. Um, and I would consider doing it again, but I wouldn't want to do it myself, too. This is another strategy going forward is uh, we want to uh, license out our content to other um, folks who know how to do this stuff rather than uh, trying to do everything ourselves. So going into retail rather than you know us manufacturing these tees and figuring out how to service the retailer and do all the individual sales with each retailer and stuff 
Um, we'd rather work with a you know best of breed firm that knows how to do that. And I think there's a good lesson there. I mean, it's kind of like I mentioned focus earlier, but also uh, do what you're really good at. Yeah, right. And and that's why yeah we're I mean, what we're good at is our online community, Threadless.com, like keeping everybody excited and motivated to submit there and making it the best place to share and monetize your work. Like doing all the groundwork for how we go about making those things happen isn't really our focus. So all the uh, sort of ancillary stuff that you guys are doing now, it's all in support of Threadless or related to Threadless in some way? Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It, I mean, if you look around, you can see there's a bunch of random weird things everywhere. <laughs> we have, um, you know, even though we're kind of like a tech-based company and we work behind computers a lot, we really like to find ways to get ideas outside of our head and um, by coming together and like building par parade floats and um, you know props for photo shoots and drawing on walls and stuff is just I think you know a way for us to turn our, our ideas real um, so we also are pretty scrappy you know like this we didn't hire a interior designer to come do this we like to um, just kind of build stuff out on our own and figure out like you know a way to make it make it our own one of our co company values is be an artist which i think is not about you know drawing necessarily it's about bringing a piece of your self to to your job like you're not hired to be a cog in our system here um we we're not trying we don't want everybody to just fit in so um yeah we we have a lot of unique individuals working here <laughs> how big is Threadless? Like how many employees do you have? We have about 55 employees. And then in our, so we do our own order fulfillment. Um, if you guys want to take a peek through those doors after, you can see the warehouse. Um, in the warehouse that scales from about, you know, 15 employees up to, um, you know, uh, over 100 sometimes. So each of our 15 full-time employees back there can manage a team of about 10 to 15 people. So when we do sales, um, bring in a lot of temporary workers and staff up for that. Do you have the normal sort of seasonality for e-commerce around the holidays or? Yeah, it's pretty typical where you know, our last quarter is like 40% of our revenue. Usually what we do is when a design is first printed, we'll go into it kind of light, you know, we'll print a few hundred. Um, and then if it sells well, we'll chase into it right away. Um, and then we'll reprint things later on that have done well as well. So, um, you know, some stuff could go up, sell out those first couple hundred, and then be, be gone because it didn't, um, you know, do as well. But some stuff can get, can continually be reprinted over the years. That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. <laughs> Um, I think really what, um, honestly, it was my, my wife worked here for a long time and she like really whipped the business into shape early on <laughs> because, um, she's a chemical engineer and she worked, like understands taking a small thing and making it big like that's what chemical engineers do is they build processes around how to make something at scale and um, early on we were all over the place like you would order a shirt on you know December 10th to expecting to get it for Christmas and it would arrive on your doorstep like January 22nd um, so she came in and she really like helped us a lot with took over all of our um, customer service our warehouse our legal our accounting and I guess, like, made it feel like a legit business instead of a hobby. Um, I think most of our mistakes have been around figuring out how to balance DIY <laughs> mentality from, like, focusing on the things that matter. You know, going all the way back to starting too many side businesses um, to more frequent, more recently, you know, the retail store and the, you know, I think um, we need to figure out ways to uh, do the things we wanted that we think are going to grow the business without 
necessarily doing everything ourselves all the time. Like even another example would be in our warehouse. We wrote our own order fulfillment software from scratch for years. We just it wasn't till about a year and a half ago that we switched to a off the shelf thing. And half of our developers' time was spent, you know, servicing our order fulfillment software, which doesn't really help us to be able to do innovative things on our platform when we're spending all our time on that. Yeah, for a long time we used a off the shelf blank, you know, that you can buy at a distributor, and uh, we switched to a private label program a while back, maybe three years ago or so. Um, to try to you know save some costs and have a custom garment, um, but yeah, I don't know. Pe the one thing is people don't buy from us because of, of the blank; they buy from us because of the the design. So um, you know, we're, we, it, it is interesting how much it's changed over the past 14 years, though. Like early on, it was a real thick, boxy, you know, 100% cotton tee that most people wanted, and then. American Apparel came around and we started using them for a while and then now it's people really like a soft kind of like 30 singles cotton tee and tri blends are really big right now so we do on the overall trends we you know try to keep up with what's going on um, but we're more focused on the design than we are the blank I think the price point we s launched with back in 2000 was $15, I think. And um, we wanted to stay competitive where it could be an impulse purchase for somebody. We didn't want to be too, like, fancy. <laughs> I know when you think about real art-based T-shirts, you can go to Barney's and buy a shirt for, like, $120 or something. But we wanted to be more approachable. Um, and, I mean our community being these independent artists who are going through art school and college and we wanted to make sure that we were a uh, product that they could you know see in their lives um, and over time we've evolved it mostly I mean right now our price point's about 20 bucks and we've been experimenting with a $25 price point too um, but we have gotten into it we, we do a lot of sales where we discount pretty heavily which I think is been good and bad and we're trying to not rely on it too much because once you get caught into that it's just like you want to pull the sale trigger all over and over again and we're trying to back out of that a little bit so we used to do we we did these ten dollar sales where every single shirt on our site was ten dollars um, for years and years and years and we haven't done a site-wide ten dollar sale in about a year and a half now because so I think it also kind of takes away from why we w want people to be buying we want people to buy from us because they want to support an independent artist, not because they're getting a cheap t-shirt. And the artist gets paid more if we sell it for a higher price. There's been a lot of examples of artists kind of like finding their careers through Threadless, really. I mean, um, there's, there's no barrier to submitting on Threadless. You could be uh, anybody. And then once you're printed, you, a lot of people have been discovered through Threadless, and um, yeah, there's even artists who have gone on to start their own T-shirt lines. Like there's this guy, uh, Glenn's, uh, G L E N N Z. Um, his name is Glenn, and he's from New Zealand. He went on to start his own uh, T-shirt line called Glenn's, um, and he he was printed like 30 times on Threadless. And we actually, so we do a meetup here um, every year, a family reunion. Um, where artists all around the world fly here to Chicago and hang out for the weekend. And after he stopped submitting to Threadless and started his t-shirt line, we flew him here um, to speak to our artists and, and tell his story to them, which I think is kind of like a lot of people might look at what he did and, and think, you know, he's competing with us or he left and it's a bad thing, but we really supported that idea. It's... Yeah, we do a lot of social media marketing. We we have a pretty big present. We did a deal with Twitter a long time ago to do Twitter tees, and we had a business called Twitter tees for a while, and so we were able to build up a follow. I think we have like 2.5 million Twitter followers, which is we so we use that channel quite a lot. Um, and but I think 
even though, so our Facebook following is more like 800,000, but Facebook is probably 10 times more valuable than Twitter to us. Um, and then we use Tumblr and Pinterest, and but we, we do do a little bit of paid advertising, um, not a ton. We, we made a big move with paid advertising a couple years ago and decided to pull back from that. Um, but overall, our marketing is more about um, telling the stories and building, building content and uh, just creating remarkable experiences. Is there a big overlap between um, your customers and the designers? In other words, do um, designers buy a lot of your t-shirts? Yeah, they do. Um, but they make up a small percentage of our customers. Um, but and it, the overlap too of people scoring designs to buying isn't as much as I'd like. Like the some of the scoring data isn't as actionable for us as I'd like it to be. Um, so we're another thing we're working on. When it, so we have like 1,500 designs submitted each week, and to ask somebody to go give us their opinion on 1,500 designs a week is kind of like a monumental task. To, so the people that we have scoring are. A lot of really hardcore, dedicated fans that get in there and pr do that. Um, so we're launching features to surface more of the good content so that we can get opinions on the best stuff. Um, kind of like a Reddit model where you have, you could, if you go to the home page, you see the great stories. Um, but when you, if you really want to dive in and see the fire hose of everything, you can do that. Um, and you'll have dedicated users who do do that. But. Uh, yeah, I think we're trying to gather, because that's another thing is, that's really, I think, the most valuable thing that Threadless has to offer is knowing this design, if it's printed, it's going to sell, you know? So we're trying to answer that question as best as we can. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why we've done a lot of these licensing deals, too, where we can have officially licensed apparel buy those things, but that doesn't always work when it's something that maybe is more controversial. So, um, you know, we, sometimes we'll print something and we'll get a cease and desist on it and we'll deal with that, but um, there's also the, uh, the idea of, you know, the protection you can get under the DMCA where, um, where artists can submit to a platform um, and so long as we're not doing curation, uh, it can't end up in a loss. It protects you from, so they, then the intellectual property holder sends a takedown notice. So we're exploring different ways of approaching the, the legal issues. <laughs> but um, sometimes what we'll do is um, when we get contacted about something like that, we can end up turning it into a partnership. Uh, a lot of the companies that hold those licenses would rather you know earn the royalty on yeah if it's selling why not yeah all right cool all right guys let's wrap it up but uh let's give a warm round of applause for jake thank you thank very you. much yeah, thanks for having me awesome everybody thanks for coming Just, uh,